Good evening from New York. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. Welcome to the show. Our guest this evening, and this is the last day of the month of March, which is, happens to be Women's History Month. As I mentioned to you in the beginning of this month, that I will only invite women in celebration of Women's History Month. So it's only fitting that the show closes with my dear friend and mentor, Rosalind McClymond. I will take a short break and when I return, I will introduce you to her. I am back, this is Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. The lovely lady next to me is Mrs. Rosalind McClymond. Rosalind, what should I say? Good evening <laughs> and welcome again to CWS Journeys. Thank you so much, Selwyn. Good evening, it's great to be here. You play such fantastic Thank music. Thank you. Thank you, it's the ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> was that, who was that, Letambulu? It sounds like yes. Letambulu. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, South Africa. Guy you know her, huh? Oh, from since you, before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> I channel, and you probably had a lot, oh, you probably yeah. had experience with a lot of this while you were living in Africa. And then before, uh, the nine, late oh, 1960s, right. early 1970s, before I went to Africa. I grew up uh, I'm in a home where my mom used to play Miriam Akiba and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you have been here before, and, and, and while... I might have asked you all the questions I could possibly ask you mm. about your life and your life's journey. Mm. One might imagine that, what, what could he possibly ask her again? But what I know personally of you is, here is this woman, this amazing, phenomenal woman, who's always reinventing herself. And as a journal, an author and a journalist, mm. you're always pushing the pen mm -hmm. and giving us amazing literature to read. And I want to thank you for that. Oh, you're quite right? welcome. I really want to thank you for that. But you were born and raised in Guyana. Yes. What have you learned from growing up in Guyana? Oh, my goodness. That still guides the way you conduct yourself today. Well, the whole notion of, of, of a, a society that cares, a caring society, a society that is responsible, where each is responsible for the other. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in the days, and I have not been to Guyana in a very long time, mm -hmm. but when, if you're doing something, you're misbehaving in the street, somebody knows you. Guyana's population is so small. It's a big country, but somebody knows somebody who knows somebody, or you're related to someone, and that person will tell on you. Right. And then you have, you know, you have to account for yourself. But that's, that's one of the things. I learned also... The, the pride of, 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 of being who I am, of being of the ethnicity that I am, because I have seen people in the highest positions in the country who look like me or who look like people of color, mm -hmm. people of color, mm -hmm. you see. And so there is that ease, that comfort, comfort with, uh, with, with different kinds of people. You learn to, to be comfortable with. Mm -hmm. different kinds of ethnicities. I've learned from the school that I went to, starting with Comenius Moravian School and then Bishop's High School, the grooming and the strength of women, mm -hmm. um, not just in, in school, but in my family. We had a lot of female teachers and there were a lot of male teachers in elementary school who cared. Mm -hmm. So the formation, the um, you know, the, 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 the comfort level, the, the being able to, the ability to walk this earth among different kinds of people and different kinds of culture and feel confident. Uh, that is something that I, that, that, that really, really, really has shaped me mm -hmm. from Guyana. And I've been able to travel all over this world with that confidence, that ease, of dealing with people of different cultures and different ethnicities. You mentioned the strength of women. Mm -hmm. You mentioned being exposed to strong women. You went to a school yes. that groomed and prepared strong women for a leadership position in this world, Bishop's oh, High yes. School. When you think of a Guyanese woman, what comes to mind? <laughs> <laughs> 
laughter. <laughs> we laugh a lot. You know, I get a lot of, because I'm married to a Jamaican. Uh -huh. um, I get a lot when I say, I know I am not Jamaican. You know, all these Jamaicans think because you're married to one that you're one of them. I say, I'm Guyanese. And then immediately they say, you know, Guyanese are such nice people. Mm -hmm. Guyanese women are so nice. We're, we're very uh, welcoming. We're very hospitable. We're very warm. We're very embracing. I think there is that strength of it. It's, it's not. It's it's a bishop's thing. Yes, but I think bishops has an added advantage in the grooming that we got. Most certainly, because those were some very very strong women. But within the Guyanese culture, we smile a lot. Um, we are able to assimilate very easily into whatever circumstance we find ourselves. We can adapt and turn it to our advantage, you see. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of the Guyanese women, I think of um, oh, all of those bishops, teachers, all of the, the, my peers at right. bishops. I think of my Sunday school teacher, God rest her soul, Miss Smith. Mm -hmm. And all of the other Sunday school teachers, I think of my elementary school teachers, all of those women who were so, so, so wonderful, excellent role models. You know this place, this country, Guyana, it's a country, we all know this. But you were in Uganda at one point, right? Yes. Okay. So what do you tell a group of Ugandan women about this place, this Guyana that you, <laughs> where you were born and raised? What do you tell them to give them an, a feel for Guyana? Well, the way I live my life. In fact, when, when I first got to Uganda, everybody who's from this side of the Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. is called an American. So oh. Guyanese, Trinidadian, African-American, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And we were all considered Americans mm -hmm. first, you see. In fact, the very night I landed in Uganda, we were sent to, uh, we were taken to the YWC. That's a friend of mine who's Trinidadian. Mm -hmm. And we went to the YWC and the head, the, the, the headmistress or, or, or the, the head of the YWCA, she immediately put us into a room with a white British girl who was leaving the next day um, because she thought that's where we would be most comfortable because we were all... Americans or Europeans. Right. Race did not matter. It didn't matter. So what did I tell them? My students in Uganda, when you say Guyana, oh, Forbes Burnham. Students, yes. Really? Yes, yes. They're, 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 it's like us in, in Guyana. You're very astute in geography. Yes. You yeah. learn. And so people knew what Guyana was. People knew where Guyana was, mm -hmm. the kind of country it was, those that I interacted with. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, there's a Guyanese woman that I met there that, and who, you know, when I returned in November after 40 years, I went to see her. She was married to a Ugandan, but Guyanese have been going to different countries in Africa. So we're not an unknown entity. Once you get past the American thing and they realize, oh, Caribbean, oh, Guyanese, then they boil it down and they already have had some interaction with us. What, you've lived a lot in Africa. Mm. Uganda is one of the places. Have you lived anywhere else? Oh, yes. I spent most of the years in Congo, the Democratic the Republic Democrat of Congo, yes. What about living in those places that remind you about Guyana, about <laughs> living in Guyana. Well, the the, the um, it's tropical, of uh -huh. course. A uh -huh. lot of the food is the same. Um, you know, the music. Well, the Congolese music, I think, is the best in the world. You know, wow! For dancing, for when it comes oh, really? to dancing, you can't beat Congolese music. Um, what is it? It you know, everybody thought of you as one of them until you open your mouth and oh. they heard the accent because you know i'm telling you that we look no different mm -hmm. when my father for example came to see me my parents came to see me in uganda uh, the the ugandans were amazed because my father who was pure african pure-blooded no mix unlike my mother 
people could not believe that my father did not speak the local languages. They could not believe it. They say, but you really don't speak? But you, you look like one of us, but you, you don't speak. They could not understand that all he spoke was English. Wow. And so I ran into that a lot, you know. And if you want to carry yourself as distinct from the people that you're living with, mm -hmm. then of course you'll stand out and um, suffer the consequences. You know, <laughs> that could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. But I was married to a Congolese, so I was, um, I was Congolese, so I was, um, I was essentially Congolese, but American too. <sighs> I saw you at, at the recent Network Journal Annual Awards luncheon. Can you tell us a bit about your work with the, with the journal? I joined the Network Journal 12 years ago. Uh, yes, 12 years ago. This month actually makes exactly 12 years. And it's not something that I was keen on doing. I had left the newspaper I was working with and just wanted, I didn't want a full time job again. So. Working with the Network Journal, when I finally decided, okay, this guy has asked enough, enough times, I thought I would be able to put a mark on it. I wanted the, the magazine, which was um, trying to be, I will say trying at the time, to be a business magazine, but I wanted to make it solidly business mm -hmm. and the, with a look, a business look, and a conservative business look. Mm -hmm. um, I was coming from a background of of very orthodox business journalism through the Knight Ritter Corporation and the Economist Group. Mm -hmm. And so that stamp I wanted to give to the Network Journal. And to a large extent, I, I think I have succeeded in doing that. It was a wonderful base. The, um, the founder, the, the, the owner of it, the publisher of the Network Journal had done a fantastic job, the previous editors, and so it just needed honing in some more and being given that distinct stamp and the content, the editorial needed to be brought up a little bit more, I mm -hmm. think, uh, introducing more global business as, mm -hmm. as the world was opening up, as Americans were going overseas uh, to do business. And so, yes, I think I, I brought that particular stamp to it. What, what, when you first joined, what were some of your earliest fears? Fears. Mm -hmm. Fears. Did you have any? I had no fears. What about your yeah. earliest challenges? <laughs> um, challenges, you know, when you, I was given, I was given full editorial leeway, mm. authority. And so I had to set the tone. Okay. Um, I knew what I was about. I'd spent enough time in, with Knight Ritter and with the Economist Group. And prior to that, while I was doing a master's degree, I worked at Bear Stearns, which is no longer uh, in existence, but the Wall Street firm. So I knew precisely what I was about. I knew what I wanted. I discussed it with the publisher, and he gave me full freedom to go ahead and do that. The challenge is finding business writers. Not so many of us are really schooled in writing business stories, business articles. I wanted numbers, I wanted statistics, I wanted context. I didn't want fluff, I didn't want PR kind of writing, promotional writing. I wanted solid business stories that gave depth and, 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 and not just reporting he said, she said, mm -hmm. but put it in a context that made it relevant to the audience that we're targeting, which is a black professional and business owner audience. And so the challenge, and it's, to some extent it still exists, mm -hmm. of finding good business writers who would write for the amount that we would pay them. Yes. You know, we're not the Wall Street Journal, we're not Inc., we're not The Economist magazine.